All right, now that we've defined different stress types, tension, compression, torsion, shear, let's talk about the strain that they evoke and how we know how much strain they're going to cause for a given stress. To do that, we need to introduce something called Hooke's Law. Now, Hooke's Law works for elastic deformation. What is elastic deformation? Well, like the name suggests, elastic, like an elastic band, you stretch it and then it goes back to normal, right? So it's reversible. Elastic deformation is reversible deformation. It means that the things get stretched, the atom atomic distances get stretched more than they'd like to be, but when you're done, they go back. So it's not permanent deformation, that's plastic deformation, okay? Hooke's Law is something you probably learned about in Physics 1 at some point. Hooke's Law says the following. It says when you apply a stress, you're going to get a strain, and how much strain you get is proportional to the constant proportionality known as Young's modulus, or the stiffness, right? We usually call it E sub Y, sometimes just E, right? This is named after Thomas Young. That's why we call this Young's modulus. Thomas Young was an amazing guy. They call him a polymath, right? What's a polymath? It's somebody who's brilliant in lots of areas says he made notable contributions to the field of vision, light, solid mechanics, energy, physiology, language, musical harmony, and Egyptology. He's been described as the last man who knew everything. Super cool guy. I love that we named this constant after him. So you should all be that way, by the way. Don't just get stuck studying one thing. Be curious about the world all around you. I like material science, and I also like painting, and I like making costumes, and I like all sorts of things. I hope you'll do the same thing. Learn lots. Okay, so... Young's modulus is the constant of proportionality that tells you how much strain you get when you apply a stress. What should the units of it be? Well, think about units over here. The typical unit of stress is going to be Pascal or megapascal even more commonly. This has no units. Strain, right? We decided it has no units. Therefore, the units of Young's modulus must also be the same as stress, megapascals. Oftentimes, it's such a large number, they'll do it in gigapascals. But as long as it's a stress unit, doesn't matter, okay? We have lots of materials where stress and strain are completely proportional, and it's a linear relationship, right? So you can see that here in this plot. Here we're plotting stress versus strain for a bunch of different materials, right? You see the blue, red, green, and purple lines. Take a look at that blue line. It's a perfect linear relationship between the stress on the y-axis and your strain on the x-axis, right? And the slope of that line right here this slope would be equal to your Young's modulus, right? Your stiffness, that's the constant of proportionality there, okay? So, how about this question? Of these four colors, which one represents the ceramic, which one is the polymer, and which one is the brittle steel, right? Okay, when we, what do we know about ceramics? They are very stiff. Is it easy to bend a plate in your kitchen, a ceramic plate? Not at all, right? And when it does start to bend even a little bit, it snaps, it pops. So that's definitely our blue line, right? Our blue line over here is for sure going to be our ceramic. It has a very high stiffness, a very high modulus, but a very low tolerance for strain. It just breaks. All right, what about the polymer? Which one's going to be the polymer? Well, the polymer is much more likely to be this material down here. How hard is it to stretch some sort of plastic? Well, relative to a metal or a ceramic, it's not too bad, right? I can take this Noosa lid and I can flex it really easily, right? So it's strained and it didn't take very much, okay? So this is an example of a polymer material and you can see that on the purple line. Then you've got two different metals maybe, right? You've got a really brittle steel. That's going to be the one that is doesn't tolerate as much strain. So this one right here would be our steel that's brittle. And then this down here might be our ductile steel or some other ductile metal. Okay, so these stress versus strain curves are very important in material science. We always learn about them, and there's special names for the different things that happen at different spots, right? The top of that curve, the point where it starts to bend, we have special names for these. So let's dive into some of these. First, though, is I want to point out that most materials which are elastic have linear elasticity, like this blue and this red material, right? It's linear over this region, where again, because we're in the elastic region, I can load it all the way up to here to that stress so it's got some strain at that point, but if I let it go, it will go right back to zero. It'll go back to the, the way it was before, okay? So it's elastic. But there's also materials like cement, cast iron, and some polymers which have nonlinear elastic deformation. So their stress versus strain curve might look something like this, 
but it's still reversible. It can go like that over and over. And then only if you go too far at that point, it becomes plastic deformation, okay? That would be an example of nonlinear elastic deformation. For most materials, though, once it bends, right, once you see this curve bending like that, that's a key moment. In fact, we give it a special name. We, we call it the yield stress when that happens, right? So take a look in this plot. In this plot, here's our linear elastic region, right? Again, there's that nice linear slope, and they've shown that it's equal to the modulus, right? And then, at some point, you bend it so much that it starts to depart from that, right? So technically, it starts to bend right there and it travels that direction, okay? They have a very special point. So right there is an important point, and then right here is an important point. We call that point, the stress right there, we call that our yield strength, or yield stress, either way, because it's starting to yield, right? And then this lower one, where it technically starts to yield, we call the proportional limit. The proportional limit and the yield strength are those two points. How do we define yield strength? It's the point where as you're deforming it, <clears throat> so you're stretching something and then you let it go, it's going to shrink back a little bit. So it's going to shrink back with the same slope that our modulus has, right? Again, this is the same slope as our Young's modulus, E sub Y. And if it comes back to exactly 0 0.002 strain or 0.2% strain, that is the point where we say deformation is now the onset of plasticity, so it's yield strength. So this is just totally convention. There's nothing magical about that number, 0.2%. It's just that we as a community all decided, all right, we have sense enough instruments that we can measure pretty accurately when 0.2 strain has occurred. So we'll say at that point, it's now plastic deformation is setting in, and it's not, it's not elastic anymore. Okay? Technically, it should be over here right at the proportional limit. That's where plastic strain uh, sets in. But since it's hard to measure the exact point, we settle on a point that everyone agrees is something we can measure, which is 0.2% or 0.002. Okay? Um, now remember, we learned about Young's modulus before when we talked about bonding in materials. We said that when you draw force, the, the interatomic forces of material versus the separation, right? So if you've got like a positive and a negative cation, these things experience a force drawing them together. But eventually, if you were to pull them too close together, you would get overlap of the clouds, and that's not good. And therefore, there's this sweet spot. The sweet spot looks something like this, right, in terms of our net force. This is F net. There was a point right here where there was no net force. So that is the sweet spot where they're going to just be right uh, and not moving. Okay, so we call that R naught. So where was stiffness in this drawing? Stiffness, again, was if you took the slope right at that R naught value, the slope of that line right there, right, that should be proportional to your stiffness. The actual equation that we had, we said that E sub Y, our Young's modulus, was proportional to 1 divided by r naught of the second derivative of our energy. So d squared e dr squared evaluated at r equals r naught. Okay? Now, what are some typical values that we should have in, in our mind as we're thinking about stiffness, right? Ceramics are more stiff than metals, and these are more stiff than polymers. You can know that just from experience. But the numbers are something like a ceramic can be maybe 50 to 400 gigapascals. And then going all the way down to polymers, they might be less than a gigapascal. It might be 100 megapascals up to maybe 5 gigapascals for something tough like Kevlar, right? Um, and remember that a gigapascal is 1 billion pascals, 10 to the 9th, okay? Now, uh, modulus of elasticity does not stay constant when you change conditions, right? As you heat something up, if I heat this lid up with like a blow dryer for a while, is it going to be easier to bend and stretch? For sure, right? It becomes less stiff. So sure enough, for most materials, as you heat them up, their modulus of elasticity goes down, right? And some other things can happen to them. We'll get to that with uh, deformation in the next chapter, okay? Now, the last thing to say about this is that shear stress and shear strain are also proportional. It, it's basically Hooke's Law all over again. This time, you've got your shear stress, which equal, that's tau, is equal to our shear strain, but not by the Young's modulus, it's by G, right? So that is now our shear modulus. So instead of modulus of elasticity or Young's modulus, it's shear modulus, which is just the constant proportionality for how much shear occurs, shear strain occurs when you shear something.